Let's just assume we have a common interest here, which is to preserve strategic stability in East Asia and the West Pacific. My strong argument to our friends in Beijing, as it would be to our friends in Washington, would be to begin to embrace the principles of what I argue for, which is managed strategic competition. Uh, a no holds barred strategic race between uh, the two sides in East Asia and the West Pacific ultimately has the implication of forcing states to choose one or the other. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mary Eintema, president of World Boston, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this evening's program with our very distinguished speaker, Kevin Rudd. It's my very great pleasure and honor to introduce the Honorable Kevin Rudd. Um, I will keep this brief so that we can jump right in, but I encourage you to read uh, his full biography on our website. So Kevin Rudd became president and CEO of the Asia Society in January 2021 and uh, has been president of the Asia Society Poly Inst uh, Policy Institute since 2015. He served as Australia's 26th Prime Minister from 2007 to 2010, then as Foreign Minister 2010-2012, before returning as Prime Minister in 2013. He's also a leading international authority on China. He began his career as a China scholar, serving as an Australian diplomat in Beijing uh, before entering Australian politics. Um, I'll also note that he has a hometown tie um, and was a fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School. And um, this is a really uh, fun thing. We now may refer uh, to um, the Honorable Kevin Rudd as Dr. Kevin Rudd, because on top of everything else, he got his PhD from Oxford, um, I believe it was last month. So Dr. Rudd, uh, welcome back virtually to Boston, the home of the bean and the cod, and welcome to World Boston. Go right ahead. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mary. It's good to join all of our friends at the World Affairs Council and uh, World Affairs Council Boston. Um, I remember fondly uh, spending uh, a good year um, in uh, Cambridge, which I suppose is part of Boston, depending on which side of the River Charles you take your point of view from. Um, and uh, I spent many a time wandering around uh, Boston and its many um, libraries and public institutions. It's a wonderful part of America, a wonderful part of New England. And thank you also for the warm introduction and, uh, and our subject uh, for um, this uh, discussion. Uh, let me just open with a few reflections on um, uh, the Quad, uh, the Quadrilateral uh, Security Dialogue, um, and also the role of China uh, within uh, that frame. Probably the best way to uh, begin my remarks is to simply describe the nature of strategic change in East Asia, the West Pacific, and more broadly now what is called the Indo-Pacific region. There are three big change drivers I think at play. One is China's increasing national power, whether it's military power, economic power, or technological power. And China's own consciousness of this change in the balance of power with the United States as China now believes that it is at the cutting edge of overtaking America in a number of these areas. The second big uh, change driver is the particular leadership of Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping is the subject of my own doctoral studies that you just referred to uh, at Oxford over the last four years. Um, and in particular, Xi Jinping's ideology. Xi Jinping is a leader like we haven't seen in China really uh, throughout the last 35 years. Radically different to Deng Xiaoping, radically different to Jiang Zemin, radically different to Hu Jintao. Uh, and the core element of that difference as it affects foreign policy is that he's adopted a more nationalist and more assertive approach uh, to the articulation of China's interests and values in the region and in the world. Xi Jinping has not been a status quo politician he seeks to change the situation on the ground 
in order to maximize China's national interests. And this represents a big departure from what we've seen uh, from Deng Xiaoping, who preached for a generation for the need for China to hide its strength, bide its time, and never take the lead. Xi Jinping, by contrast, has said, we should be out there as China striving for achievement and to make material changes in our own operating environment. The third change driver I think we need to be mindful of is the changing posture of the United States itself. As of the end of 2017, uh, we saw then National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster draft a new national security strategy for the United States, which redefined its relationship with China from one of strategic engagement to a new one of strategic competition. In other words, the United States saw itself as a, in a new contest with China, where the end point, if you like, the prize for that competition, would who would emerge as the preeminent power, both regionally and globally, between these two great powers. China, by mid-century, sees itself as wanting to secure what it describes as the great rejuvenation of the Chinese people, of the Chinese nation. And that actually is code language for becoming the preeminent regional and global power. The United States, however, has indicated both under the Trump and Biden administrations that it doesn't intend to take that challenge lying down. And it's responded vigorously and with an increasingly bipartisan uh, national security strategy on China. These then, I think, are the three big change drivers in our wider region. And how does all that rate relate to the Quad? Let me conclude my remarks by saying this. Um, when you see a new power emerging anywhere in the region or anywhere in history, international relations theory tells us that other states usually respond by one or two mechanisms. They either bandwagon uh, with uh, the emerging new power, or they balance against the emergence of that new power. What you see with the Quad is an example of the latter. That is, countries as disparate as Japan, India, Australia, and the United States deciding that the best way to continue to secure strategic equilibrium in the Indo-Pacific region uh, is in fact to band together to balance against the emerging strategic power and footprint of China. That ultimately is the strategic logic which underpins the Quad. And that's why we have this new emerging geopolitical reality in our wider neighborhood. That's the background, but Mary, I'm open to any questions you may now choose to pose about the Quad, the member states, or uh, frankly, rising China as well. Back to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a feeling that we're going to have uh, many questions, and, and I have many as well. Um, I guess about, because um, we're, we're, we're talking about two interrelated things here tonight. One is your book, which I, I highly recommend to everyone. It's uh, very rich and very clear, which is an unusual combination. Um, and, also, and also the the larger concept of the quad. Uh, so in your book, um, you uh, sort of put your cards on the table and say that um, your deep experience of China and America um, has not resulted in political capture by either side. In, in, uh, in other words, um, you, um, don't feel that you're taking an ideological point of view, but um, but trying to offer a, a pragmatic framework. Um, so um, maybe you could explain more about uh, your notion of managed strategic competition, um, which, as I understand it, is is kind of our only way forward in your view, um, and and how the quad. Um, benefits or, or hinders uh, that effort. Well, you're right. I seek in the, uh, the book, which is entitled The Avoidable War, not to take a partisan position either with um, Beijing or with Washington, mainly because you've got a thousand other people doing that. Um, <laughs> and you have a cheer squad for the United States, you have a cheer squad 
for China, and you have a number of people sitting in the grandstand as well. Um, look, I have a natural affection for the United States. I've lived here for the last six or seven years. Australia is one of America's oldest treaty allies. And so um, I have a, um, a defined view about where my own values lie. At the same time, I've spent a lot of my career in China, uh, an ancient civilization, a remarkable literary and philosophical tradition, 1.4 billion people who, with the assistance of the Communist Party, have pulled themselves literally up by the bootstraps out of poverty. Um, and now China, having gone through what it describes as its century of humiliation at the hands of the outside world, from the opium wars, the British occupation, through to the end of the Japanese occupation, 1945, believing that its time has come and a time for China to resume its proper place as a central power in the overall architecture of the global order. So what I've sought to do is not to say, well, here's a strategy for America to win this contest, and least of all, have I suggested one for, for China. What I am suggesting, however, from a realist frame, is how, in fact, these two great powers engage now in strategic competition with each other, can manage that strategic competition, because the, the alternative is unmanaged strategic competition with no rules of the road, and therefore the continuing prospect of what I describe as incidents, escalation, crisis, conflict, and war. And if you want an historical precedent for how these things can unfold badly and rapidly, uh, simply go back 100 years to the events of June, July, and August of 1914. None mm -hmm. of the great powers back then wanted to go to war, but it became an almost inescapable reality as strategic competition between them <clears throat> became somewhat unhinged and there was a massive failure of diplomacy in managing the crises between them. So managed strategic competition in a nutshell is this. We accept the reality that competition is occurring. This is not sprinkling what I describe as a ladle full of Scandinavian fairy dust across the top of a roiling strategic competition and saying, if only these two guys really understood each other better, it would all be okay in the morning. Well, it's not quite like that. In fact, if you go to Washington, Beijing, as often as I have over the years, they will say, well, we understand the other guys a lot, and that's why we're competing with them. And, yeah. that's, and that's why we've got this competition unfolding. No, my frame is not idealist, it's, real, <clears throat> it's realist. And it says that what we need to be doing instead uh, is to have a series of strategic guardrails around the principal strategic red lines and strategically controversial issues between these two countries. I nominate five of them. They're self-evident. Taiwan, South China Sea, East China Sea, Korean Peninsula, somewhat less self-evident, and cyber and space, somewhat invisible to most people, but there's a contest underway every day on that between the two nation states. So what I argue is rather than there being no guardrails between the two states as they engage each other increasingly militarily in these five domains, that there should be de minima guardrails uh, which uh, enable uh, each side to understand the other side's fundamental red lines and to understand the consequences which are likely to arise if those deep red lines are crossed. At present, it's simply a game of push and shove with equilibrium being established, if we're lucky, on the basis of half an hour of push and shove and therefore the game is up and we re-establish equilibrium. Well, the only problem with that, if you've observed um, kids playing push and shove in the playground, is that sometimes it gets out of control and someone falls over and then it starts to get nasty. That's always the rolling risk when you don't have guardrails or rules of the road. The second element of managed strategic competition is pretty simple. It says if you can have mutually understood but not agreed strategic guardrails between the two countries in these five critical domains, then it's possible to have non-lethal strategic competition across the rest of the relationship, in the rest of foreign policy, in the rest of security policy, in the rest of um, economic policy, trade, investment, technology, et cetera, as well as, of course, 
the ideological contest between uh, liberal democracy on the one hand and liberal capitalism versus the forms of authoritarian uh, regime uh, discipline which you see in China together with the forms of state capitalism which it's evolved. And the final part of, of managed strategic competition, the third part, uh, is to still have sufficient mutually agreed political and diplomatic space for there to be continued strategic cooperation in areas of defined common interest and where there, is a, where there are a series of global public goods at stake, climate change, continued global financial stability, given that we're about to go through yet another period of roiling financial markets around the world, turbocharged by high levels of sovereign debt coming out of the pandemic, but also global public health, the next pandemic, whatever shape or form that may take. And of course, nuclear non-proliferation. Um, because whatever may be occurring in the strategic contest between Beijing and Washington, the complexity of that would be uh, minor compared with the emergence of a number of other nuclear weapon states around the world, whether that's North Korea, whether it's Iran or others, going nuclear in response to those developments. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, that's the concept of managed strategic competition and better in my argument than unmanaged strategic competition. If the objective is to reduce the risk of accidental crisis, conflict, escalation and war in the remainder of the 2020s. Back to you, Mary. Okay, um, well, I have a, a couple of more questions. One. Uh, so you, you, you talk in the book and indeed in IR, we, you know, we think about this a lot about, um, uh, varying priorities, um, or, uh, strategic priorities, um, and our understanding of China's, uh, priorities and theirs of ours, um, may not align perfectly. That said, um, it seems that everyone understands that Taiwan is, is a priority. So I wonder if you could talk about um, the importance of Taiwan, uh, the likelihood of uh, an actual shooting war um, occurring around Taiwan um, in, in you have, you have said um, elsewhere that um, you know, it's probably not going to happen in this decade. <laughs> not until not until the early twenty uh, thirties. I'm, I'm not sure that's encouraging or not. Um, what? Yeah, uh, talk about where we are on that issue and what you advise, what you see um, in terms of both uh, U.S. and uh, China. That is PRC um, actions around Taiwan. Well, you're right to point out to the fact that Taiwan represents, you know, the grand doozy of them all. Um, of the five areas of strategic contest I referred to before, Taiwan is numero uno. Um, and there's a reason for that. The Chinese Communist Party takes seriously the completion of its own national revolution. They've said since 1949 uh, that Taiwan is an inseparable part of the People's Republic of China. Um, and it's a renegade province, and what, sooner or later, they're going to bring it back under Chinese sovereign control. Meantime, um, the Taiwanese and those mainlanders who fled there after 49 have a different worldview. They've evolved their own local political system. In the last 20 years or so, that's become a democracy. Uh, they've become a vibrant economy with an open society, um, and based on multiple opinion poll surveys have no interest in being reabsorbed into the People's Republic of China, least of all under a communist administration. And so that's where we're up to. The key um, instrument in uh, terms of the United States power in, in this is the current legislative arrangements under the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979. There are many provisions in that act I'd suggest to your listeners and viewers that they take time to reread the Taiwan Relations Act, but it, it has some pretty interesting provisions. 
one of which, of course, is for the United States to continue to provide armed supplies to Taiwan in order to help the Taiwanese sustain a level of the balance of power between themselves and Beijing, despite the obvious inequalities in the national capacities of both sides of the Taiwan Strait. What we've seen in um, really in the last several years is the Taiwan question becomes sharper and sharper in its focus in US-China relations. Uh, we've seen, for example, uh, on the uh, Chinese side, the deployment of uh, live fire drills uh, against the island following a visit of Speaker Pelosi to Taiwan. Um, this succeeded in delivering a significant interruption to maritime trade and to air traffic. Mm. Uh, we had uh, Chinese military assets uh, flying uh, with uh, considerable um, close geographical proximity to Taiwanese offshore islands and the Taiwanese mainland itself, as well as missiles being fired over the island. Now, this uh, is increasingly provocative behaviour on the part of China, together with China's now routine practice of ignoring what historically has been regarded as the medium point between uh, the Chinese mainland coast and the island of Taiwan with multiple flight incursions across and over the median point. Now, the Chinese would argue that this um, uh, increased hostility on their part is, is a reciprocal response to what they perceive to be the United States' increasingly systematic violation of the One China policy, which was part and parcel of the recognition of the PRC back in 1979 and formed a key element of the three underpinning communiques between Beijing and Washington in 72, 79, and 82. The Chinese point not only to American arms supplies to Taiwan, that's been going on for the better part of 40 years. Um, what they point to in particular are these incremental moves by a series of US administrations now to increasingly provide varying forms of um, political recognition of Taiwan's separate status. In the time of the um, Trump administration, you had cabinet secretaries from the United States for the first time visiting the island. Uh, during this administration, of course, you had the visit of the third most senior person in the constitutional arrangements of the United States, the Speaker of the House of Representatives. You've had a number of uh, senior congressional visits, although they have occurred under previous administrations. But in particular, the Chinese would say that uh, the uh, statements by President Biden on a number of occasions now, <clears throat> unambiguously committing the United States to military action in support of Taiwan in the case of a military crisis with the mainland, is of itself walking further away from the one China consensus, which the Chinese argue was, under, was underlined in the three communiques, which underpinned diplomatic recognition in the first place. And furthermore, President Biden's inference that China, Taiwan's future independence was a matter for the Taiwanese themselves. And of course, that is a fundamental red line from China's perspective. So therefore, we are now at a level of tension across the Taiwan Straits, which frankly we have not seen since previous uh, Taiwan Straits crises in the 50s and then again in the 90s. Um, there have been three of these, two in the 50s, one in the 90s. And I think what we're beginning to see now is the emergence of a fourth Taiwan Straits crisis. Final point is, in terms of the application of managed strategic competition, what might it look like? It might look like in the case of Taiwan, something like this. The United States agreeing to adhere to the traditional components of the one China policy, not affording Taiwan uh, de facto forms of diplomatic and political recognition. It would not in involve uh, any walking back of the Taiwan Relations Act, but nor would it involve walking that forward in the direction of what's now being considered in the United States Congress in the so-called Taiwan Policy Act, which in one of its provisions would have Taiwan designated as a non-NATO uh, treaty ally of the United States. For the Chinese, um, if the United States was to, for example, 
adhere to a red line in terms of the one China policy, the Chinese would be required to step back from the medium point to cease and desist from provocative military uh, uh, and weapons overflights of Taiwanese islands or the Taiwan uh, main island of Taiwan itself, and to take the military temperature of its exercising arrangements way down from where it is at the moment. The whole logic of managed strategic competition is to in fact decrease the temperature uh, around this particular issue. Whereas at present, we have a series of actions which one responding to the other ratchets that temperature right up. If I was to put some numbers around it, um, right now the temperature, given I'm with an American audience, in the US-Taiwan uh, relationship is probably ho hovering around about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. It's uncomfortably sticky. <clears throat> um, with a bit of managed strategic competition at play, I'd really like to get that down closer to a much more comfortable 78. <laughs> Still a bit warm, um, but frankly not all that far from where it has been in the 50 years which have passed since diplomatic uh, recognition by China of the United States back in uh, the 1970s. Back to you, Mary. Great. Uh, well, I have lots of questions, so I think I'm, I'm gonna be a little sneaky here and kind of let you decide <laughs> between them. Um, one is, uh, you know, so let's think of it this way. In, in your uh, very close and informed view, what is more important in, in, let's call it great power relationships right now? Um, the quad uh, and its efficacy and its viability um, or the relationship between uh, Xi and Putin? Um, and uh, yeah, so, so you see what I'm driving at here. There's a lot of different places to look um, right now. Uh, I think the best way to conceptualize this is along these lines. Let's look at the overall strategic operating environment of this relationship, US-China uh, over Taiwan. Um, that strategic operating environment is obviously uh, directly impacted by the balance of um, bilateral forces uh, between uh, the two sides, military, economic, technological, and the rest. And the Chinese would see that balance as having been slowly shifting in their favor in recent years. Mm -hmm. But in addition to the military and um, economic capabilities of the two principles, you have, of course, the military, economic, and technological capabilities of their friends, partners, and allies as well. Um, and that's where the Quad rolls in. Mm -hmm. The Quad forms part of the overall balancing uh, or rebalancing uh, against the rise of Chinese power in order to re-establish equilibrium. The Chinese, in response to that, see some utility in their emerging, quote, strategic partnership without limits with the Russian Federation, uh, right. as articulated on the 4th of February this year, just prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And whatever we may think of the unfolding military disaster in Ukraine from uh, the Russian perspective, leaving aside the extraordinary damage which uh, that uh, invasion has um, inflicted on the good people of Ukraine and destruction of the Ukrainian economy. From China's perspective, having Russia more firmly in its strategic camp, militarily, technologically, as well as uh, economically in the supply of, of guaranteed and premium priced energy commodities and agricultural commodities, is seen as an overall, as it were, rebalancing in the other direction. Mm -hmm. In other words, what you're seeing is the emergence of a series of blocks beginning to balance against each other, quite apart from the singular impact of the assets of each of the major powers themselves, that's China and the United States. Mm -hmm. My argument about managed strategic competition exists separate to this phenomenon. It says it recognizes that that's the underpinning reality that both sides are operating within. However, what are the rules of the road to govern the day-to-day -day behavior of the two major powers within that framework, namely US-China relations in and around Taiwan, in and around um, 
the South China Sea, and in the case of China and Japan, in and around the East China Sea, in order to manage in a more stable format that relationship. A bit like the Russians, then the Soviet Union, and the United States managed their relationship after the near-death experience, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Back to you, Mary. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to go to our excellent uh, community members now. Um, we'll go to you, Raul. Go right ahead. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, would you kindly address the economic dimensions that you see most important in the next few years as between the Quad and the PRC? Um, you mean the economic dimensions of the Quad as, that will, as it would unfold? How the Quad is balancing Chinese economic expansionism? I think if you look carefully at how the Quad is a um, strategic partnership uh, between the four countries, has sought to give effect to this rebalancing um, effort so far is in two clear domains. One is um, it becomes is becoming a vehicle for, let's call it, the friendshoring of technology or high technology between the Quad partners and other friends and allies uh, of the four countries. In other words, to create a level of uh, security of supply chain between those countries and other friends and allies in order to make uh, those countries and their friends and allies less dependent on China as part of the overall supply chain. The second area where we see this unfolding uh, is the meeting of Quad energy ministers and how that is unfolding in terms of security of energy supply, again, between the Quad partners and uh, their friends and allies as well. Among the four quad partners, the two energy rich ones are the United States and Australia. The two energy poor ones are Japan and India. So therefore, new arrangements between these four in order to ensure that, for example, India in the future may not be strategically dependent on the supply of Russian oil and gas, um, and that Japan's long-term energy needs can equally be met. But similarly, of course, mindful of the dilemmas faced by our friends in Europe, how can the Quad assist through its energy minister collaboration processes in working with Europeans now dealing with the interruption to gas supplies coming out of Russia uh, as a result of um, Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine? So energy policy, high technology policy, in order to make both these areas less vulnerable to interruption uh, by China. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, okay, so now we'll go to uh, Leslie Griffin, our fine World Boston board member. Leslie, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you, uh, Dr. Rudd, former Prime Minister Rudd. Uh, my question is, I understand on Monday next week, you are going to be introducing a new Asia Society Center for China Analysis. And I was just curious what you could share with us, um, you know, in advance of your launch, as far as sort of how this center will be situated other, alongside other uh, prominent centers of China thinking. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much for the question. Um, we at the Asia Society have been around for 65 years. Uh, we began at the um, height of the um, Cold War, um, barely uh, three years after the end of the Korean War. The mission statement of the Asia Society for the last 65 years has been one of navigating shared futures between the United States and the countries of Asia. And now we would conceive that as navigating shared futures between the countries of Asia and the countries of the world whether that's in security, the economy, technology, across multiple domains. Um, and we've provided a pretty open platform for these questions to be discussed and debated between friends and foe alike over a long period of time. We have a pretty long-standing philosophy that it's better to talk than not to talk. That's a little old-fashioned in the 21st century, but we actually think there's a value in that. Now, our trustees, uh, six or seven years ago, decided to graft onto the Asia Society think tank, 
um, rather than simply a convening platform. And that's how they managed to invite yours truly to come along uh, to fashion the Asia Society's first think tank. And so we began with a small staff of uh, four or five folks. Um, we began to elaborate a research program uh, involving China, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and the usual categories of, um, of domestic politics, economics, foreign policy, national security policy, but also climate and sustainability. Then, um, six or seven years later, we discovered uh, that the demand upon us as an institution to provide robust, independent, original, analytical advice on the US-China relationship and China domestic was becoming so great that we needed to expand our capacity again in order to do that. So within the Asia Society Policy Institute, we've decided to uh, graft within it a new center for China analysis. I'm pleased to say it's um, being headed by Dr. Bates Gill, a well-known sinologist. Uh, Bates has previously headed the uh, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, previously headed the US Studies Center at the University of Sydney in Australia, um, uh, and a well-credentialed a well sinologist who's written recent books, for example, on the Chinese leadership, one entitled Struggle. But within the Center for China Analysis, we'll be producing integrated analysis of Chinese domestic politics, the economy, China's foreign and security policy posture, not just with the United States, but with every other country which is wrestling with dilemmas because of the two 1,000 pound gorillas wrestling in the front living room at the moment, that's Washington and Beijing, as well as China's critical role in climate change and sustainability. And finally, an analysis of what's actually happening in Chinese society, public health, uh, these things which rarely uh, make, um, make the news and China's broader culture as well. So we will have uh, branches of the Center for China Analysis engage in each of these areas. And uh, we'll be bringing on board an increasing number of experts full and part-time to assist us with that. And so we're looking forward to um, kicking off as of the uh, 3rd of October. We've already launched on our website a, um, a series entitled Navigating the 20th Party Congress and try to explain in plain English what the hell this all means, as opposed to normal gobbledygook, which those of us who are China specialists tend to go on with and try to explain uh, Chinese Communist Party Congresses and who's up, who's down, and what the hell it all means. So our website seeks to unravel that in a way which we hope is meaningful to the rest of the broad community here in the United States and across the world, but also the policy community as well. Back to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so sorry. Now, thanks. Uh, so now we'll go to uh, Wei Qi or Wei Qi. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, go right ahead. Thanks, Mary. We're actually going to go to Marcus first, and we'll pull up. Oh, I'm sorry. Whoops, Marcus. Sorry. Go ahead, Marcus. Hello, uh, hello, Mr. Uh, Dr. Rudd. Uh, my name is Wei Qi Chong. I'm associate professor at Suffolk University, which is very close to uh, to Harvard. So uh, I would like to uh, shift the topic back to international politics. So at the beginning of your remark, uh, you mentioned that when there's a rising power and then states tend to either bandwagon or balance against it. And so far we see that most of the neighboring countries of China decide to uh, balance against it. Right. So, of course, from the Chinese perspective, they definitely would hope more countries would bandwagon uh, with it. So, in your view, what should China do or what could China do to persuade more countries, especially in Asia, to bandwagon with it? That's my question. Uh, well, normally, I thank you uh, very much um, for uh, the question. Normally, I don't provide public advice to governments about what they should be doing. Uh, either Beijing or Washington. But I think uh, if, let's just assume we have a common interest here, which is to preserve strategic stability in East Asia and the West Pacific. My strong argument to our friends in Beijing, as it would be to our friends in Washington, would be to begin to embrace the principles of what I argue for, which is managed strategic competition. 
uh, a no holds barred strategic race between uh, the two sides in East Asia and the West Pacific ultimately has the implication of forcing states to choose one or the other. And when I go to Southeast Asia in particular in the 10 states of ASEAN, uh, these are states which don't want to make a binary choice between these two large entities. It's too simplistic to say that you know, the, um, the smorgasbord that people prefer to eat from in Southeast Asia is, I'll buy my politics and security from the United States, and I'll buy my economy, thank you very much, from China. But there's some kernel of truth in that because China has emerged as the dominant trading partner for each of the 10 ASEAN states. Um, and a significant investment partner, though not the dominant one in each of the ASEAN states. America remains a big investor uh, in uh, much of Asia. But the bottom line is, if China and the United States can agree on basic strategic guardrails to manage their competitive uh, behavior within the region and to take the strategic temperature down, all countries in the region would welcome that. In fact, right across Southeast Asia, and I believe Northeast Asia and South Asia, they would welcome the overall strategic temperature coming down. <clears throat> so therefore, <clears throat> whether you're American or whether you are Chinese, uh, this would be enormously beneficial. Of course, when you sit down with Chinese government officials, they will point the finger at the United States and said, the reason the temperature is going up is because of you guys. You're screwing around with Taiwan, um, you're uh, engaging in uh, hostile actions with the Quad and with AUKUS and a whole range of other instrumentalities. You're imposing technology bans on China. You've imposed a whole series of trade restrictions on China. You're constantly accused of human rights abuses and you expect this to be a normal relationship. On the other hand, the United States will say, well, uh, China under Xi Jinping has changed. It's become infinitely more assertive than ever was. You said you wouldn't engage in island reclamations in the South in the South China Sea, but you did. Then you militarized them, which you said you wouldn't do. In the East China Sea, you are uh, seeking to exhaust uh, the Japanese self-defense force by throwing in waves and waves of uh, air and uh, naval and coast guard assaults against Senkaku Diaoyudao. Uh, with the Taiwanese, uh, you are demonstrating increasing uh, behaviors which look like the wargaming of what you would do in the event of a real uh, war to regain Taiwan. Um, and in cyber and space, China remains highly active uh, against sovereign states and against uh, commercial entities around the world. And then they'll say, and look at Xinjiang and the human rights abuses among the Uyghurs. And so that is the argument from both sides of the, um, of the spectrum. My argument simply is someone who actually would like to see stability and peace is that given the reality of this competition, accepting some de minima guardrails, some de minima rules of the road would assist in not only helping both countries have a more stable relationship with each other, reduce the prospect of accidental conflict, crisis and war with each other, but be of great benefit to all the other third countries in the world, which would then experience a less binary emerging order between them. That's why I argue for this managed strategic competition. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. All right, let's see if we can quickly get in two more questions before our short time is up. So Marcus, go ahead and then we'll go to Hassan. Okay, thank you. And uh, g'day, uh, Kevin, congratulations. Well, Marcus Breen, nice to see you. Marcus, I know from uh, Australia. Oh my goodness. Well, go ahead, Marcus. Even, even more than that, Marcus was a groomsman at my wedding. Oh my back, God. Way back in the Mesolithic period. Was, it, was that what it was called? Uh, well, good to see you and thank you for your comments and especially for your promotion of peace. Uh, absolutely crucial. Uh, I'm a member of uh, Mass Peace Action Association and we work very hard to promote the cause of peace. As you know, I'm interested in the uh, question about uh, the great, great rejuvenation, uh, Chinese culture and society and history. And I'm wondering uh, what kind of thoughts you have, and I'm sure you have many, 
about the implications for how China and the rest of the world could actually be more closely informed or better informed about the, the rich history of the country, particularly its Confucian traditions, but many other considerations of which the, the, the currency, global currency, is basically ignorance. Thoughts on that, please. Thank you. You know what? I'm going to take the moderator's uh, privilege to see if we can really get in the maximum here. Let's, um, if he's available, let's get Hassan's question as well. And then Dr. Rudd will let you answer them in turn. Uh, so go right ahead, please. All right. Thank you. So uh, I wanted to raise a very fundamental question, which is how inherently racist is the Trump-Biden-China confrontation policy, right? I mean, I was just looking at a fortune list of companies recently, and Germany quietly became the largest automobile manufacturer in the world. Volkswagen is now twice the size of GM. Okay. No hue and cry about European nations, right? But uh, anytime an Asian power seems to rise, suddenly... Uh, America enters a confrontational approach. And, uh, you know, Monroe Doctrine is what we practiced here. But somehow when similar things are done by China, uh, it's... Uh, so anyway, that's, that's the question. So those are two very big picture questions for you to end on, sir. Good luck. <laughs> well, thank you for both those questions. Uh, on the first one, uh, which is... Um, uh, something I refer to in the book, um, uh, Marcus, which is uh, these two countries are characterized by what I describe as mutually assured non-comprehension. Um, and, uh, and I know enough of Chinese and American elites to know that, uh, frankly, there are huge um, gaps in understanding what really makes the other side tick, what core national interests and values really are, and what each side is actually doing about it. Um, I think the most relevant consideration there is on the American side, there is often an assumption that China is one giant monolithic mass rather than representing, frankly, uh, an extraordinary range of uh, views within uh, Chinese society. There are 1.4 billion people in China, 95 million members of the Chinese Communist Party. That's 1.3 billion who are not. And therefore, there's a, an enormously broad spectrum of views. There are 300 million Buddhists in China, probably 100 million uh, Protestant Christians, probably several tens of millions of Catholics. Then you have, of course, the Muslim minorities as well. Uh, then you have those who have um, a much greater commitment to classical uh, Confucian traditions uh, and Taoism, uh, as opposed to Marxism-Leninism, which is the orthodoxy of the Chinese Communist Party. So it's true the Communist Party has uh, an iron grip on China, but beneath uh, the surface, there are a multiplicity of views. And even within the Communist Party regime itself, under Xi Jinping, there are a range of views as well. On the flip side, uh, where I find uh, China doesn't understand the United States is that it assumes that the United States would never act to, for example, militarily defend a democracy like Taiwan because they do not see that as being in uh, America's national interest to risk, as it were, as the proverbial logic would go, Taipei for... Um, for um, uh, uh, San Francisco in any uh, military exchange between the two countries. But that, on the other hand, misunderstands the nature of American democratic exceptionalism and the fact that America, while it does pursue its national interests, is also driven by its own perception of its national values as well. And you see that alive, for example, in American military support for Ukraine, at present, which is not a treaty ally, but where the United States concludes for a combination of geopolitical reasons, but value-based reasons to intervene 
through the supply of um, military arms, equipment, and ammunition. So there is a massive um, uh, non-comprehension between the two sides, uh, where, frankly, um, institutions such as the Asian Society have a role in often explaining more fully each side to the other. On the second question, which is about racism, what I'd say, Hassan, is this. Um, one of the extraordinary blind spots of white guys, and that's uh, Marcus is one of them, and I'm another one, um, but also um, Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Celtic uh, majorities within the Anglosphere, plus uh, wider European culture, is this total blind spot towards the impact of 500 years of European colonialism across Asia. I find this remarkable. Like in my own country, Australia, I find the blind spot towards the um, attempted um, liquidation of indigenous land rights on the part of Aboriginal Australians, as if, um, uh, as if Aboriginal Australians never existed when European colonialists first arrived and their rights were sim simply extinguished. In fact, Aboriginal people themselves were nearly extinguished through the arrival of Europeans. So you can either try and push all that to one side and pretend it never happened and sweep it under the collective uh, rug of history, or you can be mature enough as modern democracies to say, uh, these atrocities were committed in the past, that colonialism and imperialism were intrinsically evil, um, and that the treatment of, for example, First Nations or First Peoples was, um, was equally evil, and seek to make, um, shall we say, amends for that. Uh, at the same time, in my dealings with uh, China, and I covered this at the, in the book, Hassan, is that you don't have to be in China for a long time to understand that there is a particular racial view on the part of Han Chinese towards non-Han minorities within China, which some would describe as racist. Uh, Han Chinese views of Indians, for example. Uh, Han Chinese views of um, Uyghurs. Han Chinese views of Africans. And there's enough on the documentary record to indicate that this is not a flattering history of perfect racial equality on the part of the Han majority within China itself. So my overall argument is um, the West, so-called West, has a lot to answer for in terms of uh, its colonial history, which cannot be happily just swept to one side by, you know, um, by a rolling exercise in British pomp and ceremony or various other Western derivatives thereof. Um, it is a reality which needs to be acknowledged, accepted, if we are to move on, just as uh, China needs to accept that its own history in terms of the treatment of Tibetans, of the Uyghur minority, as well as other minorities at home and abroad. Uh, there is a great gap between the reality and the ideal as well. Back to you, Mary. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, there is so much more to cover. We haven't even talked about the 20th uh, Party Congress yet, but uh, we'll leave that hopefully for another day if you come and visit us again. Um, let's virtually please uh, join in thanking Dr. Rudd for fascinating commentary. Um, thank you for being with us. Thank you, audience, uh, for attending and your thoughtful questions. And uh, we hope to see you again soon at another World Boston program. Uh, but until then, have a nice evening. Mm -hmm.